good morning, Deed Grabbers. Welcome to Goat Talk this morning. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Hey, let us know that you're on here. Jump on, say hello, give us a like, hit that heart button or something. Let us know you're here and that we're uh, talking to somebody more than ourselves. Uh, I want to welcome all you guys this morning. We're here today talking to Lisa Englehart. Uh, Lisa is a investor, a uh, real estate broker. Gosh, is there anything you don't do? Uh, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, she's a sub two coaching uh, group student, and uh, we're proud to have her here today. She's also going to be speaking for us at the sub two Palooza. Guys, if you haven't got your tickets yet, we're still in early bird pricing, but that's going to end pretty soon. So uh, get over there and get your tickets at sub two Palooza. Dot com. We'd love to see you there. We're going to have a relatively small group of investors, uh, going to have some excellent speakers like Lisa, uh, Bill Walston, Bill Bronchick, Scott Horn, John Burley, Richard Roop. We're going to have some great people there and have a fantastic time down in the French Quarter. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, but Lisa's here today. She's going to talk to us uh, about a few things. Uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, some of her creative deals. Also, she is an REO expert. And while we don't have a lot of REOs right now, uh, when the foreclosures start coming, we certainly will at that point. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, REOs, how they work, how to get a good deal on those, and also about some things that, uh, that she's doing now to help with affordable housing. So Lisa, welcome to Go Talk. Thank you, William. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, so Lisa, tell us a little bit about you and, uh, and, and how you got started uh, in real estate investing. I got started because I did REO for so long and I kept seeing this one guy's name come across my desk and because he was buying my REO properties. And I looked him up and lo and behold, he was this big time investor and right in my hometown and he was having a boot camp. And I went to the boot camp and it changed my life forever there. Then I set my exit strategy because I was really burned out doing REO at the time. And it set up my exit strategy for me to invest full time. So that's that's how I got started and how I ended up becoming a real estate investor. Yeah. And, and gosh, I don't want to date anything, but how long have you been investing now? I'm going on my fifth year. Fifth year? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Doing yes. fantastic up there. Yeah, great job. Thank you. Hey, Kevin, good to see you. Andrew, glad you guys are here. Uh, Rudy, good to see you this morning. Phil, Joe, nice to have you guys on here. So uh, tell us a, a little bit about, uh, I don't know, let's let's take one of, uh, of course, we're, you know, we focus on sub two here in creative finance. Tell us about uh, one of your creative deals that you guys have done recently. Uh I challenge myself. I like to buy sub twos with no money in the deal. Absolutely. In fact, you know, I'll get even at close and I don't want to have to take any money to close and I'm not trying to sound chinchy. I will, but I just, I borrow private money for my, to make up the back payments and to cover my closing cost. And if I break even fine, if I have to take a few dollars there, that's fine too, obviously, but I've actually gotten a little bit of money back, not much, but you know, less than a hundred dollars. And that's kind of what I like to do is, is just be very creative, make sure I cover myself and just, just work it creatively so that, that I can do a whole bunch of them like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's what we all want to do. That's, you know, that's for me, that's a target. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, a sub two deal, a creative finance deal has three profit centers and I want all of them. I want something on the front. I want that cash flow in the back end as well. Uh, hey, Dana, good to see you, Sarah. Glad you're with us this morning. Uh, so uh, so you, you do creative finance. I know you, you guys do all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I think you, you've been a flipper in the past too, did wholesale stuff. Is that how you got started? I think that's what you told me. You started out flipping stuff. Excellent flipping. I've never wholesaled because I've, I've just worked in, you know, to find my own deals. And mm -hmm. really, I just didn't want to let anything go because if I get a good deal, I don't want to, I don't want to give it to anybody else. I, I want it. So yes, mm -hmm. I've been doing fix and flips for years. I actually did my first fix and flip about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I didn't make a whole lot on it because I, it was in a historical area that um, I didn't quite uh, plan out my um, expenses quite well. But I ended up 
getting uh, 25,000 in tax credits. So I, I didn't have to bring money to the table. I did make a little bit, but those tax credits really helped me out. So yes, I um, fix and flips are a lot of work, as you know, and I try to avoid them now as much as possible. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, you know, my first 12 years as an investor, I was a transaction engineer. And, you know, we just did generic marketing in a lot of cases and whatever lead came to us, we, you know, okay, this is a rental, this is going to be a lease option that we're going to sell to somebody, this is a seller finance deal, this is a uh, fix it and flip it, you know, sell it retail, mm -hmm. man, we did everything. And that's a lot of work. So, you know, of course, over the years, uh, you know, I moved out of the country in 2010, and it's hard to manage a a, uh, a rehab from, you know, 3,000 miles away. So uh, that's why I had to find a different, a different way to do things. And we went to pretty houses totally. Uh, so, so you, you got started as an, as an investor, uh, you were a real estate broker and found yourself handling thousands of REOs. So, I mean, what was the number? You, you told me the number in the past. I can't remember. I'm getting old. but I, I, It's been around 1,200. A lot of them, uh, I've just worked with hundreds of distressed homeowners who ended up staying in their homes instead of moving. So that mm -hmm. was the probably the biggest challenge right. in working and seeing what people are really going through. I, I have a big heart for that because... Mm -hmm. I worked, um, you know, right in the trenches with these people that right. have gone through some really hard times. Right. So, uh, you know, and a lot of investors don't really understand how the REO process works. I know I hear a lot uh, from investors who go to the, say, the foreclosure auction. And if, if a, a property gets knocked off back to the bank, they're wanting to know, how can I buy that immediately? And you and I were talking about that this morning. How does that process work? Uh, once uh, a house goes to the auction, the bank takes it back immediately at the courthouse steps. How does that process work from there forward? The, the bank will turn it over. It depends. Well, let me back up for a second. It depends on the type of loan. On a regular traditional loan, the bank takes it back and then they immediately assign it to a local listing broker in that area to list and sell for them. Now, if it is a FHA property, let's just say Bank of America has this FHA property and it forecloses. FHA has to get that occupant out. They have to change the locks, clean it up, and then they turn it over to HUD and file an insurance claim. And then it becomes a HUD property. Same thing with the VA, same exact thing. They'll turn it back over to the, to the VA and the VA assigns it. Well, they have their own contracted asset management companies and then they have their own network of real estate brokers and agents. And so there's a lot of middle people in REO, a whole lot of middle people. Right. And I guess, you know, that's really why some properties can get foreclosed on today and they won't actually be available for sale for months. They go through a pre-marketing stage, but I will tell you, most of the clients that I worked with, I mean, I was getting them the next day because I can see the foreclosure date. So some of the banks are really fast and some are a couple of weeks or even a month behind. But what typically happens is they'll send their preservation, preservation company out there and secure the property, winterize it, make sure there's no damage, make sure that no one's living in it illegally. And so there's a lot of moving parts to getting it ready and getting it assigned to that listing agent. And then even once it's assigned to the listing agent, we have a pre-marketing stage because we may have to do yard work, trash out. It depends on the asset management company. Sometimes the agent has to do all of that. So I had, I have all my crew that goes out and handles everything for me, cuts the grass, changes the locks, does trash outs, attends evictions. It's just a lot of different moving parts to get it listed. But right. once it's listed, you know, then some of them have a certain time frame um, because, you know, it's for owner occupants first, and then it goes into a, uh, anybody, you know, an investor or anybody can buy at that point. Right. Hey, Corey, good to see you. Hey, if you guys have any questions, hey, Ron, uh, if you guys have any questions for Lisa, just type them in the box there. We'll get to those uh, as we go here. So if I'm an investor, if I, well, okay, if I'm an investor and I want 
to be able to buy a property that's gone to auction the absolute soonest possible. There's really no inroad. I just have to wait out the process. Is there is there no yeah. secret strategy to, to getting a deal? Do I get to know these agents that typically list the VA properties or whatever? Will that help me in any way or is there something I can do? If I had a dollar for every time I was asked that question over the years <laughs> by investors, uh, no, to answer your question, you know, banks don't do things the way we think, okay, the way that you and I would do. If I had a ready, willing, and able buyer that wanted that house, because I've even had former owners or former family members that are dying to have this house because it was it's sentimental to them. And I try my best to help them through it and they will not, they won't, they won't pre-sell it. It has to go through the agent. And I've only in my entire REO career, I've only seen one asset management company actually sell to a tenant that was living in the house, only one. And right. they still, and they paid us a commission too, paid me and, and he had an agent, but they, they didn't, they didn't require that he move. Most all of them, they make them move. They won't sell directly to them, even if they've been living in it for four or five years as a tenant. Wow. Okay. Hey, Rudy wants to know, how do you get access to REO lists? You mean like as an investor, like pre-foreclosures or what exactly? Tell me I, what you, exactly what you mean. I, it sounds like, I mean, if it's an REO, uh, it's already been taken back. Is there such a thing as an REO list? I mean, I All know right. properties, they have a website that you can go to. All right. So be careful with that because a lot of people are getting snagged in by these, these companies out here that say, I'll sell you an REO list. Don't do it. And here's why. I have had people contact me, y'all aren't gonna believe this, a year or more after I've had an REO property. And I found, I found just this property on a list. I wanna see, you know, I wanna see it. Is it still available? And sometimes I would go like, what property are they talking about? I look it up and sure enough, it closed a year ago. Well, I'm sorry, but that property closed a year ago. Where are you getting your information from? Oh, I got it from this site. Don't trust those sites. Um, yeah, it's tough because as a real estate broker, an agent, I can pull those listings in the MLS. You can pull them from Zillow. They may not be quite as accurate, but I recommend like getting connected with a real estate agent who can help you set, your, set you up on an automatic list just for REO properties to come to you as they come out. That's the best right. thing that you can do. Right. Right. And it, I, I would take that a step further and so, because you guys know how I am. I, I, I'll operate at, on the fringes now from time to time. Uh, get access to the MLS. Uh, if you it, listen, we, we, we do it all the time. There's an agent yeah. out there that will either make you their assistant or whatever. So you can have access to the MLS. You don't have to hound them. They don't have to do anything for you. Maybe you have to pay for their MLS access. It's well worth it. Uh, so you can get right in that system every day. You can search for a lot of stuff that way. And that, that would be my advice. <laughs> I have quite yeah. a few assistants. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you can meet these age, every agent, we know real world guys, we love agents. They're great, but 90% of them don't think outside the box or 95%, but that other 5%, they're out there. They're at your local RIAs. They're in these groups like this one right here that you're in. Uh, they understand what's going on. And if it, if it's a equitable business transaction, they'll work with you on stuff. Wouldn't you agree, Lisa? Absolutely. The hardest part of my job when I worked REO, and please forgive me, real estate agents that are on here, but I'm one and I feel like I have the right to speak about it. Um, I the, the, the hardest part of my job as an REO broker was working with the other agents. If I could have bypassed them, still giving them a commission and just handled the contract process myself, um, it would have just been a lot easier. Right. Tammy had a question. I went to a vacant home yesterday and found on that I found on PropStream and saw signs that it was winterized and under management of guardian asset management. Mm -hmm. Is this a sign? It's an REO. What can I do now? Or is it too late? Let me tell you this, Tammy. When you're when you're working in pre-foreclosures, 
and you go, and this is why I tell people, drive to the house. If it's a if it's a pre foreclosure, if it if the auction, the next thing you need to do with this house is find out if the auction's taken place. Because mm-hmm. I'm telling you, if it if the auction hasn't taken place, Joe Smith, sell homeowner, still owns that house. And if he's left it and it's been winterized, he'll sign. If you can track him down and get him to talk, he will probably sign anything you put in front of him. That is gold. Those vacant houses that haven't been to the auction are gold. Uh, you need to find out if that auction's taken place. If it hasn't, um, then the, the guy still owns it and you can talk to him and you can still buy it. I've knocked the door handle off of many secured houses in the past and retaken possession of them. Uh, that's not necessarily, it's a sign, it's an REA. Uh, but if the auction's taken place, leave it alone. Right, Lisa? That's right. And I can add to that. All right. So when someone becomes behind on their mortgage payments, There are people working in the background that are hired to go by and do property inspections. And there are agents that are hired to go by and do drive by BPOs. And there can be like, you know, five, anywhere from five to 20 different drive by BPOs done on these houses and property inspections. The minute that that preservation company or that agent states that this house appears vacant to me, or that preservation company goes out and says, hey, this house is vacant, they're going in. They're going to rekey a secondary door just in case there's personal property in the home or in case in some instances, locks have been, a lock has been changed when somebody's still living in it. And it's because some houses do look like they're not occupied and they really are. I've been fooled by that quite a few times in my career. But they, their job is to secure that house to keep vagrants or anybody from coming in and to secure it with winterizing it, changing lock, winterizing it, putting a lockbox on it. Because even in the loan documents, there's a little clause somewhere in those loan documents to, that state that they have the right to do that. They're securing that property, but most of the time they won't rekey like the front door unless they know they've got total possession of that property. So most definitely don't ever give up. Always take it an extra step because it could be months. And if it's a reverse mortgage foreclosure, which I've done a ton of those, that can be a year before mm-hmm. that. Now, most of those do need to go to foreclosure because of the situation, but I'm just using that as, a, as an example. Some properties can take a month, six months, and even up to a year before they actually foreclose on them. Right. Uh, Trinity had a question. Can you sub to an REO property? And I would say to that, once the bank has it, no, that's a no-go. That's no, not going to work. Can't. Uh, Tammy had a follow-up question. So call him and see if it's been in auction. Anything else to check? I, I wouldn't recommend that because I'm going to tell you, you wouldn't believe the number of times we talk to sellers who say, oh, it's that how the bank's taken that house back and don't know. I bought a house once in Macon for $100. Uh, and the guy thought the bank had foreclosed on it, but they hadn't. And it's been fact, it had been sitting for two or three years and they hadn't taken any action. And uh, so I said, if I give you a hundred dollars, if, if I give you a hundred bucks, will you sign a quick claim deed? He said, sure, I don't own it. The guy signed a quick claim deed for me. And I actually, Bank of America had had the, had had the notes sold to them. I called them up and finally found somebody in New York uh, in a department I needed and said, hey, we're doing some title work on this house. You guys are, are shown as the note holder. Uh, we're trying to get some things cleared up. Can you, you know, show us the note? Or anyway, they researched it. They couldn't find it. They sent me a satisfaction of mortgage. They satisfied a forty thousand dollar mortgage for me, and I bought the house for a hundred bucks. Wow! <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, stuff like that just happens. The best way to find out if that auction has taken place is to go to the courthouse. Prop stream may be delayed depending on where this location is. Go to the courthouse, do the title work, uh, look it up and see who the current owner of record is. If he's still the owner of record, if there's no new deed from the from the bank, the auction probably hasn't taken place. Uh, and that's how I'd pursue it. What Do you have anything to add to that, Lisa? What I do is I'll Google the address. And right. usually on the second page of the address, there's a trustee sale or some type mm-hmm. of sale that might show up under that address. And then you can also look on Zillow. I don't, you know, I'm not a huge Zillow fan, but it does have some default information on there. So I highly recommend 
check in both of those. And then you can always, um, like he said, go to the courthouse, definitely go to the courthouse. Right. Uh, Phil had a question. How do you go about exercising the owner's redemption rights after an auction has happened and the house is an REO? Have you had any experience with that, Lisa? No, but I'm not. I'm in a non-redemption state, but the bank cannot sell it until that redemption period ends. Right. So, so and that, that may be one of those cases where the house just sits and sits. And it does. Sits. They, mm -hmm. Yeah, they can't take any action. I mean, they're <clears> holding <throat> it. They're responsible for it. They have to upkeep and everything else, but they, they have to give that full time. And in states like Alabama, I think Alabama has a one year Mm -hmm. I think they do too. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I know. It's pretty crazy, but uh, but you can purchase an owner's redemption rights. Let's say that a guy has a house worth two hundred thousand. The bank takes it for a hundred. Uh, if you can track him down, and you know, because most sellers don't know about these things, they don't know they have the right to get that house back. They say, "Oh, it's gone. The bank took it." Uh, but if you can work out something, say, "Hey, I know." The bank took the house. Uh, can I, you know, buy your rights to buy the house back for whatever amount? Give them some money. Go redeem it. You can you can get the redemption rights. Uh, Kevin said, "Yeah." Uh, Kevin said that uh, uh, he I, apparently they did a lockout on his house and he had to break into his own house. Mm. Amazing. I know there was one preservation company a few years ago, Safeguard. They're a big preservation company. Hey. They had several lawsuits against them for just all kind of tactics with with doing stuff like that. They would just go and, I guess, kind of willy nilly just just take possession of houses. Uh, it's crazy. Hey, Farouk, good to see you, Ethan. Glad you're on here. Hey, Anthony. Um, so, REOs. Okay, so the, the 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 bank takes the property back. It could be a varied time to get the property listed. Uh, it makes it on. It makes it vacant and empty with nobody having any way to do anything for months at a time because banks are crazy. We all know that. Mm -hmm. uh, they just they they do crazy stuff. So, uh, so once the thing is listed, once it's available, uh, it's just for sale like any other house. Uh, but that that probably depends on whether it's a, a government backed loan or just a, a a institutional lender, doesn't it, Lisa? Yes, HUD basically has the easiest processed process on the listing agent, especially because they handle all of their own offers with which they call bids. I was a HUD listing broker as well. And so the VA has a different process. So the VA is like any other REO. When you submit an offer to that agent or if they have a certain system that they tell you to go into to submit your offer and it goes directly to them, the agent is the middle person, the listing agent, and, and just make sure that all of the paperwork is done because the paperwork is key to getting it under contract. Very, very important that it is handled properly so that it's a smooth transaction. And so we had that part down. Contracts is something that, that I've always been really good at. And so I had a certain process, the way that we handled it. So we worked to help agents get it done and get get through it. We pretty much hold their hand, would hold their hand and get them through it just to get that deal under contract. Right. So if I remember correctly, because it's been a really long time since I've looked at, at HUD properties and that sort of thing, uh, they have a website, you can bid there, but you, you need to have an agent representing you to do that. Isn't that true? Correct. You, you have to have HUD? an agent to submit that bid for you. Right. And HUD, if I recall, they have a pretty specific formula. Uh, they expect no less than a certain percentage of asking price until the house has been on the market X number of days, then it drops to another percentage. I mean, there's really no way of getting a better deal on a HUD property, is there? The longer the property's on the market with any REO, the, the better deal you're going to get. But if you go in and, and let's just say that that house is overpriced and you know it, it happens. I can't tell you how many REO properties that I knew when I was sent the list price. Oh boy, I'm going to have this for a while. Um, it takes a while to get those down, to get those prices down. Normally it's every 30 days. But something that a lot of people don't know is asset management companies that are managing these REO properties that, that it, assign them to agents, they are under, in most cases, under a contract with the, the main bank or the main um, 
you know, HUD, the main agency, where they have X amount of days from the time that property is assigned to them in the pre-marketing stage until it closes. And if they get that property closed within that time frame, they get paid more. If right. it goes beyond that, they get paid less. Mm -hmm. So they put the banks aren't gonna. If a house is listed for a hundred thousand and it's really worth fifty, and you you submit an offer for fifty, they're gonna come back at a hundred. Mm -hmm. They're just not gonna work with you, and because they they've either had an appraisal, and we've seen we've seen bad appraisals. I've seen my my share over the years of bad appraisals, just like bad B, second BPOs. It's it's everywhere in any kind of business that you deal with. But, and when that happens, you just have to wait it out. So the longer that property is on the market, the, the better deal you're going to get. Right, exactly. I know when I, when I still lived in Macon and I would make, that was one of my things, we'd make offers on, on REO properties a lot. And, you know, they would say, well, you know, and some teachers, you know, that would try to educate you on what to do with that. They would say, just submit your offer every week or whatever. And I'm telling you from experience, it's, and I'm not, we're not talking about HUD properties, VA properties. We're just talking about bank owned stuff they would take back. Uh, you could go in there. Maybe the house was listed for 75. You could offer 35 and they would counter back at full price or whatever. But then if you just walk away from it, you'd look up two or three months later and see where that house sold for 25. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just don't ever know. Sometimes they get a new asset manager. Uh, sometimes they'll say, we've been sitting on this house too long, dump it. Uh, just whatever the case may be. What's your recommendation on that, Lisa? Should I, should I just hound them and submit an offer every week? Yes, should, yes, just, absolutely. Don't give up. Yep. And here's why. A lot of asset management companies and banks require when the first contract, when the first offer is submitted to counter back at full price. Right. Okay. And then they'll wait for another counter. If it's less, they'll start working with you. Right. So don't, don't give up, especially if you want something bad enough, you might right. drive the listing agent crazy, but it doesn't matter there. They have a job to do. Keep right. sending them in. Well, Just keep sending them. What you've got to do is you've got to, again, hey, Tim, good to see you. Terry, absolutely. We don't take these out of the group. We don't tease you. I, I know a lot of groups will say the live will only stay up for three days. We don't do it. We leave it here for you. We want to help you learn. So, yep, it's going to stay. Thanks, Farouk, for answering that question. Uh, you know, it, is you got to have an agent. My agent, I, I would go, this, and this is how I worked it. Uh, you know, we established early on, if I'm going to make offers on 10 properties a week, uh, I'm not going to write 10 earnest money checks and do all that stuff. I'll tell you guys what I did. Uh, I gave my closing attorney, again, get the right one, get one that knows what's going on, what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I wrote him one check for 500 bucks and he kept it in a box, in his safe or wherever he, he may have, I don't, he may have put it under his mattress. I don't know what he did with it, but I wrote him one check and every offer we submitted said, earnest money in the amount of $500 held by Westmoreland Patterson and Mosley to be released upon acceptance of the offer and request for the money. And I never wrote another earnest money check ever. I would sign blank contracts for my listing agent, just sign them. I would call him up. He, if I had the MLS access, I would call him up and say, I want to make an offer on 123 Oak Street, 517 Maple Street, blah, blah, blah. Here's how much. He would fill out the contract. He had all my signatures and he would just submit them. And that's the way it worked. We kept it really simple, uh, you know, but you've got to find an agent that'll do that stuff with you. You know, Doug, he was my agent. He knew that if they accepted the offer, the deal was done. There wasn't any of that. I wasn't trying to flip it and do all that stuff. I had the money to close it. Uh, but just keep things really simple. Get a system. If you're going to buy, a lot, try to buy a lot of REOs. Uh, that, that's my recommendation. I don't, do you see things similar to that, Lisa? Do you have an, a system that might be easier even than that? I'll add on to that. This is the thing. Real estate agents, they only get paid if they sell houses, right? right? But here's the deal. Be loyal to that agent. Sit down with them. Tell them what you're looking for. Tell them you really want to work with them and do something for them. If, you, if they feel used, you're out of there. 
Okay, I've been through it in my younger years in real estate before I became a broker and before I got involved in REO. I had investors had that. I was going everywhere for them. And they then they would turn around and go buy the house from somebody else. And at, real estate investors and real estate agents don't get along. And here's why. They're not loyal to one another. Right. And real estate agents don't get us. Okay, so that's part of the problem too. Educate them. If you educate them and help them, you'll be surprised at how um, dedicated they are to you. And guess who they'll think of when a good deal comes up or maybe even a house that you might be interested in that they're not going to list because they may sell it to you. So well, definitely work with them on that. Yeah. If you prove to them that you can back the offer up, you've got the means to close, which takes us into Ginger's question. Can you finance an REO or do you need to have cash? You do not need to have cash. I tell you what um, a lot of people do is they use hard money lenders. Now, I will tell you, they're not the best. They, they, they will get accepted, but you're better off to have a private lender that can actually write you a letter versus just a generic. I don't want to say the name of some of them. They came across my desk all the time, but you're better off to have someone write a letter and with a generic letter than you can submit with all of your offers. And you've got to close. The worst thing you can do is, is that reputation for some of these hard money lenders, they're the national ones. That's the one I'm speaking of. There's several national ones. And they just allow the buyers just to put their whatever amount they want on it in the address, which is fine. But a lot of them don't have really good reputations in the REO world. So the, you've got to make your deal a lot more creative. So if you're in a multiple offer situation, I'll, I'll tell you this. Don't offer full price. If you want that house, don't sit there and offer full price. I see it all. I used to see it all the time. Don't offer hundred dollars over offer some off the wall number. You know, if you're, if you, if, and you can also ask that agent, well, how many offers do you have now? They're not going to tell you what the highest offer is or what they, what can be, you'd be surprised at how much, how often I was asked that to see if I would, would give it up, but um, be creative, just throw off like, you know, $2,548 over, you know, I'm just making suggestions to you. And another thing is I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sit here and tell you to waive your inspection periods because that's crucial and that's your way out, but try to minimize them. Mm -hmm. If you need an inspection, try to do it before you submit that offer, especially if there's a period before they'll start looking at offers, get over there. If you have to get somebody under it, get them under it you know, or just do a termite or something um, to try to put you in the leaderboard because banks are looking for, basically their number one thing is highest price. And some of them will outweigh how, depending on the money, the no inspection period to the highest price. But I can tell you right now, they are 98% of the time, they're going to go with the highest price. Right. Gotcha. Okay, great. So, hey, Cindy, good to see you here. Glad you're here today. Um, all right. So, you know, creative finance, REOs, and listen, guys, it's sub two Palooza. Uh, Lisa's going to be uh, hosting a round table for us on Thursday night, and she's going to talk all about this stuff. I think we've got her uh, for a round table from six to nine. So we're going to make her talk for three hours. So you guys come see us and uh, come see Lisa on that. You know, we were talking about creative financing a little bit earlier and the crazy, just crazy market that we're in. Uh, you know, a year and a half ago, the median priced home in the United States was around $250,000. Uh, I saw something a couple of days ago, the median priced home today, now this isn't every location, this is across the country, uh, it's $370,000. Uh, and it, so many things are, are just falling into place right now, so reminiscent of 2007. Uh, and and I, I vividly remember uh, uh, hearing a news report in 2007 about California and how California houses, they would come on the market within minutes, they would have offers of 50, 100,000 over asking price. Isn't that all the stuff that we're hearing today? But it's all over the country in, in, yes. in, a, in many markets. And I was thinking, you know, it can't sustain itself. If it does at the current trend, in five years, the median price for a home will be three quarters of a million dollars or more. Uh, so it presents a real problem for affordability. And Lisa and I were talking about that. And Lisa, uh, if you guys watched the podcast I did with her a couple of months ago, 
um, we talked about uh, some of the things that she's doing to provide affordable housing that's also an excellent investment. So Lisa, tell us a little bit about your, your teeny houses and how those work. When I was in the Oreo business, I dealt with a lot of people that just had nowhere to move. And if I had these teeny houses that I'm building, then I, could have, I couldn't keep up with the demand. And it's only gotten worse and worse and worse. And nobody's talking about it. The mainstream media is not talking about it. But there is a crisis going on across the United States with a lack of affordable homes. Now, I don't like to use the word affordable housing because it relates a lot to rents. Um, what I'm talking about is people need an affordable home to buy and rent because the rents are so the rents are going up too y'all in case you, you're not aware of that it's not just you know $370,000 average home price it's the rents are, are keep going up as well so i had built teeny uh, my husband's been a builder for going on 40 years and i've been building with him for 20 years he's taught me everything that i know about building over the years. I've just kind of been in the background of it because I had so many other things going on. But I started building teeny homes. And what I mean by teeny homes, they're not to be confused with tiny homes on wheels because these homes are real permanent homes built on permanent foundations. They can be built right in your backyard. They can be built on vacant lots. And I'm putting two on one lot and even more than two on one lot in some areas. So that I'm trying to solve as, as little as I am, I'm trying to solve part of that affordable home crisis. And I've just launched Teeny Homes USA. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've get, I'm getting all of my real estate investor friends on board across the United States to try to put a dent in this. And I'm showing them how to build them, how to sub everything out step by step. And I'm even giving them my, my, a teeny home plan of their choice and a material list to help get them started. Right. Well, that's, you know, that's great. I, I did a podcast with Tammy and JC uh, Gauthier uh, a few months ago as well, and they've started a nonprofit. So it's great to see investors uh, trying to do something about the affordable uh, housing problem that we have. Uh, tell us about uh, Teeny Houses USA and how that works. Hey, Tracy. Hey, Roger. Good to see you. Roger says, Lisa's crushing the tiny houses. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> hey, Scott. Yeah, great information. Yeah, Lisa's really giving us some good information today. Uh, tell us about Teeny Houses USA, how that works. And uh, I know you've got a program now that teaches investors uh, a little bit about this. And, and really, I don't know a whole bunch about it too. So I'm excited to learn about it. What, uh, what does your program teach and, and how does it help? I literally take a person from doing research to figure out where, how, and how many they could build on one lot, all through zoning ordinances and everything like that, all the way through getting the certificate of occupancy and even using some as short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you have to, it's a certain type of zoning. My favorite is rural counties. You can build them in the city, but each city has different ordinances. Some have requirements where you have to live in one house and then the house behind it, you know, you can rent it or use it as a short-term rental, but you have to own or occupy at least one of them. Mm -hmm. And then where I build, you know, I don't have to do that. So um, what I've done is I've had so much interest in these homes and then kind of going back to the REO world, I was just, I don't know, I just had an epiphany moment. There's a really, really good friend of mine in Connor in Texas that has been like my huge, my biggest supporter. And he was like, Lisa, you've got to come out. And I was like, okay, okay. So that's what I've been working on. I've been kind of hidden working on this entire project. I literally teach um, because you, let me just back up. A lot of people don't know that you can serve as your own contractor. I'm a class A contractor with my husband. Mm -hmm. You can serve as your own contractor if you own a property. Mm -hmm. You can sub everything out. So we, we can teach you how to do it yourself. But even today, not everybody wants to pick up a hammer and a bunch of power mm -hmm. tools. I've been labor before. I've done it for my husband, but that's not really what I want to do now. I, I teach you how to sub it all out and manage your entire build. So you're saving thousands of dollars because you're not having to pay a general contractor like me to come in and build it for you. And you have all that equity when you're done. Right. And the other thing is you're providing an affordable home for somebody to live in. Right. So these homes, if I'm outside or the girl that, may, that, that takes care of them for me, if we are outside, people stop by all the time. And I'm in a little bitty coastal town mm -hmm. and 
we still get people, I want one, how can they come in and they'll come in when we're cleaning and, and look at them. So they're, they've been quite popular. So that's why I had this, you know, with my friend Connor pushing me and then myself, and then I've got other friends here, Jim, everybody's been, you got to do this. So I'm going national with it. I have gone national with it. And they're even pushing me to start a, my own RIA group. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going um, nationwide with it just to try to help. Everybody wins. The investor wins, the property owner wins because you can rent them, you can sell them or you can use them as short-term rentals and it provides right. a, a nice affordable place for people to live. Right. Uh, Corey said he just put a small house under contract yesterday, has a very nice large hey. workshop that is finished with plumbing. We're going to renovate an Airbnb, both of them after watching Lisa the other day. Yay. Great. Uh, great. Yeah. Tracy said she'd love to find something like this on the market myself. There are several averages for sale near me that would be perfect. Maybe acreage. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, so what you're saying is you don't have to have contracting expenses. I mean, you don't you don't have to have contracting experience or know how to bill to be able to do this. You're going to teach right. me how to hire all the subs and do all the stuff mm-hmm. uh, yeah. myself. Great. Uh, Phil asks, are you using any prefab uh, stuff uh, to, to build these houses or is it all no. just stick built, site built stuff? Everything is stick built on site. My husband is old school and no offense, but he does not like prefab. Everything is built on site and that's how we teach it. All right. So, so, so yeah, guys, if you have questions about these teeny homes, let us have them. Lisa's here to answer those today. So what's the average cost and square footage of one of these houses? How long does it take to put it together? All right, so you can build one of these little teeny weeny. I call it the teeny weeny, the teeny and the teeny weeny. They just got that nickname when we were building them. And so the teeny weeny is 330, excuse me, 326 square feet. And then I have like six different plans. So the teeny weeny can be built in the backyard of your own property. It can be built in the backyard of a rental property to double your income. And, and like what Corey's doing, that's that's the thing. Build, buy, rehab, build another one in the backyard. So what you can do is you can put one of these little teeny weeny houses for around 30,000. And it depends on your area. Everybody's different because down South of Mississippi, your lumber prices might be different than mine. And lumber prices have just come down 40% y'all, by the way. So now my new construction is going back in business. The, um, they range up to 836 square feet. And I have some 1100 square foot plans I'm getting ready to build too. But because that's still, just because I teach you how to, to build people how to build these little teeny houses, all of these same exact processes are the same process if you're building a 1,500 square foot house, an 800 square foot house, or a 4,000 square foot house. It's the same exact process. You can build your own house by going by these steps. So that the teeny weeny will cost you somewhere between 30 and 40,000 to build. If you want to build the larger 670 square foot house, then you're looking at Mine is like 68 to 75. So it depends on what you put in it. I put granite in all of mine. I put nine foot ceilings in all of mine. I I deck them out, waterproof upgraded, pergo flooring. I make them extremely nice. So nobody needs any kind kind of upgrades. Right. So Anthony says, I love it, Lisa. I want to do what you do. Uh, Terry asks, where do we get your plan, Lisa? Lisa, where where do they need to go to take a look at your program and, and learn how to do this? I have a website. It's www.teenyhomesusa.com. Is that Teeny it Homes USA? It's T E E N I E Homes USA.com. Okay, guys. So I just put that in the uh, in the uh, comments here, so y'all can go take a look at it. All right. Uh, Jim said, curious about zoning regarding multiple structures on the same parcel, any pushback by the city or county? That's probably uh, city or county specific, isn't it, Lisa? It is. And I teach you, I actually teach you how to research all of that easily so you don't spend hours doing it. I actually walk you through two counties and two cities in two different videos in that course to show you how to do that. You can find it, y'all. It's so easy. You just have to know what to do. 
Right. Uh, Tra uh, Tracy asked about the financial commitment on doing this. I mean, do you sell these with financing? You get 10% down. You, I mean, how do you structure these things? It depends on how you want to, if you want to sell them or keep them. Now, what you can do is you can sell them like we do on sub two with sub twos, but you've got that underlying. So somehow you've got an underlying. I borrow private money to build mine right. and then I can transfer that over re refinance and, and cash out if I want to, but I just refinance mm -hmm. it because I want to try to get them paid for so that that's more money in my pocket each month. How do banks look at a 400 square foot house when you go, let's say you, let's say that I borrow uh, private money to build once I've completed that, then I go in and either sell it with seller financing or use it as a rental or however I do it. And I want to refinance out of my private money. How does a bank look at a, a teeny house like that? Is it any different at all? Some of them, it depends on the appraiser. And Corey is an appraiser in our group. So mm -hmm. he he's going to be a great one to ask. Um, and Corey might chime in on this if he's still on. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it depends on the appraiser. Some of them have even kind of used it as like a duplex. Mm -hmm. or they'll just do the main home and then consider the other one as a guest house and give it credit for that. So it just depends. Right. right. Tracy asked, would four acres be enough? Gee, you could probably put eight on four acres. I would be looking to subdivide that four acres, depending on how it's laid out and depending right. on the requirement for the road frontage per the county or city. You know, I've seen in, in some rural areas in the last several years uh, as, you know, because it, there, there was almost like a, a, a minimalist uh, tiny house movement that's been going on for several years. But I've seen places that almost look like mobile home parks, but they had tiny houses on it if you know what I'm talking about, I do. almost like a mobile home park sort of thing. You're and not then, talking about that though, are you? You're no. talking more about individual homes or maybe one or two that you can either use as rentals or Airbnbs or something like that. Yes. And I tell you, if you go and just Google, you know, tiny homes for sale, look at the prices y'all mm -hmm. look at the prices of these homes on wheels the thing about it, they're really cute. I love them. You can take them anywhere you want to go. That's the great thing about them. But anything on wheels is going to devalue right. over time. Yep. When you have one of these built in your own backyard, y'all, I don't need to tell y'all where your investment's going. Yeah. So um, to, 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 talk, to, to talk more about that, William, I want to do a big teeny home development, but the numbers really have to work because your price ranges are low. So I have found that it is a lot more um, affordable to mm -hmm. just go after lots. That is the right. best way to do it and build multiple ones on lots and unless you get one heck of a deal on a piece of land. But the engineering costs, I've been there and done this, and, and having to put in paved roads, it just takes you to a whole nother level right. and your profit margin just keeps going down. You know, I can see just because because I'm always thinking about if I hear about something new, I'm always thinking about how to work it. I know in a lot of places, a lot of towns, I've seen this in the past, especially when I lived in places like Macon, where 50, 100 years ago, the houses were much smaller. If a house burns or something happens, that's lots really too small to do much with now. But you could take advantage of that with a, a teeny house. My favorite way to buy is an old dilapidated mobile home mm -hmm. and I'll, the ugliest house around the eyesore in the community. And that's the way that that's, I, I look for those. Right. And of course, vacant land, you're not competing against every investor out here. Who's looking for a flip. You're not right. overpaying. You're not having the oops. Um, I have this problem. You know, I've, I've got to come out of pocket with more money or I'm going to take a loss on my prop, you know, my, my bottom, my, when I go to closing, mm -hmm. you know what your costs are with new construction. I'm very spoiled. I don't care if I ever see another house to flip anymore because right. I, and even, and let me just say this back in 07 and 08, when the market crashed, I, I was in new construction. Then we had to rent some of our houses because we didn't want to, we don't want to take a loss on them and we weren't giving them away. So we rented them, which was, I hated to do. But it was brand new. But the thing about teeny homes, y'all, I don't care if there's a crash tomorrow. Mm -hmm. These teeny homes are going to sell even more because they are so little and affordable. And that's why right. I'm doing it. 
And and at the price point, not a whole lot of worry. If I buy a four hundred thousand dollar house today, and the market crashes, my house might be worth two two fifty. But if you've got a house right there that's only seventy five thousand, it can't move much. <laughs> not, not as right. much potential for loss. Tracy had a question. First question was where did we get where do we get the plans for your houses? And I think you offer those with your package at Teeny Homes USA, right? I do. Um, my, I'll tell y'all. I don't. I don't have a problem telling you here. My course um, sells for four ninety seven, and it has over seventy eight videos. I know that sounds like a lot, but they're not boring. I promise you that they're, they're not boring. They are straight to the point, and some of them are, are short, but they go in order according to the building process. And I also give away a teeny home plan, which is a, an actual blueprint that you can take and your your area. Um, should accept it, but if they don't, you can have your draftsman edit the PDF. But plans, I don't know if, if, if you're not familiar with new construction, having one set of plans drawn is anywhere from 750 to 1200. Right. Mine have actually gone up to 1200 since these. Right. So I'm giving away a blueprint of your choice. I have six plans. You can see those on the teenyhomesusa.com site. You can see the, the way they're laid out. And um, and if you can buy a package deal if you want all six plans, all six material lists, because I provide a material list as well. You can buy all six plans and all um, six, you get the core six plans and then the six material lists. And also with each package, you get 30 days free private coaching in my private coaching group where I'm, you have access to me and my husband. And then uh, we have, um, we're going to be doing live builds and stuff in this, in mm. this this group but that's for $14.94 you get all six plans so it's a it, it's a if you're into building that's that's the way to go because that's the best deal but if you want to start out and you you're going to get the whole entire course and the materialist and your plan for four ninety seven. dollars okay Tracy also asked do you partner with people in their locations I will I've been asked um, already and I, I will do a JV it just depends on um how you're doing the financing, you know, how you're funding your, your teeny home build. And I'm actually working with two companies now who are going to uh, provide funding and financing for teeny home builds. So I haven't got that finalized yet, but that'll be coming out on my um, teeny homes, Facebook page, teeny homes, USA, Facebook page. Right. Uh, Ethan asks, have you found any uh, city or county incentives or tax incentives or any type of incentive uh, for building or, or helping the, the, the housing crisis and, and providing low cost housing? Not yet, but we're, we're going national with this. And I have people on my team that are helping me. We're contacting all of the major cities and really making contact with city councilmen and county um, representatives, because we have to get to the bottom of this. This is a national crisis and something I'm telling y'all has to be done about it. And so to answer your question, I have not, um, gotten into that yet, but I will tell you this, a lot of municipalities are, are rethinking this whole concept to where they are, if they don't allow them currently in their backyards to build, be built in the backyards, they're working on it now because of the demand. The demand is there, they know it, and I'll be posting a lot of information about this coming up soon. Okay. Uh, Phil asked, have you targeted empty lots in nicer neighborhoods? And if you have, have you gotten any pushback from the neighbors? I don't because I don't want to deal with an HOA. Uh, there's exactly. too many other opportunities out there, y'all, especially in rural counties. If you go to a rural county, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how rural you are. Somebody's going to buy it or somebody's going to rent it. That's right. Somebody wants to live out of town and, and, and you're exactly right. You're not going to have all those restrictions mm -hmm. that you would have in the city. Uh, Chris asked, I have a couple of mobile home parks where I'm looking to remove or replace some of the mobile homes. Could I potentially build a teeny house in their place? Yes, you can. On all of my plans, there is a monolithic slab, which is a um, concrete slab um, as an option. And there's also a crawl space. So that includes that, that on the plan. The only thing about that is most of your plumbing is in that monolithic slab. Mm -hmm. So you may have to tear up the slab that's there and, and put a new slab in, which is what I would recommend, but it just depends on how it's set up. But yes, that is what I'm looking to do now, be, um, buy existing mobile home park and then turn it around into a teeny home. 
Teeny Home community. Like a community. You're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Phil said always cleaner and smoother than a rehab. Dana says great information. Hey, Dana. Good to see you on here this morning. Uh, yeah. So great. All right. So I can tell you're passionate about this, Lisa. I mean, we've I been know. talking about REOs and we've been talking about creative finance. We start talking about the teeny homes. It's just like, Woo. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We got to do I do. It. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I, I love seeing somebody being really passionate about what they're doing. Uh, so again, uh, teenyhomesusa.com. And you've got a couple of different different levels of participation, I'm guessing, 290, uh, 497 for your, uh, your basic program. And then uh, uh, you've got uh, plans. Uh, do your plans, Phil asked, do your plans include fire sprinklers? No, we're not required to have that in Virginia. Okay. They can so, be added, but I don't have those on there, no. Again, that, that would be specific, I guess, to, to locations. Mm -hmm. uh, if Phil's in California, they probably have to have mm. gosh knows what. Uh, but you, uh, you actually walk them through the process of finding out what the county or city requirements are uh, for permits and everything else. I'm sure this is a mm -hmm. soup to nuts sort it of is. thing. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, Sarah said, building in a mobile home park, would the buyer of the teeny home still pay lot rent? It just depends on how you want to set that up. That's on an individual basis. Okay. You guys, if you have any other questions, throw them in here. We've got a few more minutes left. Uh, anything else, Lisa, that you wanted to share about your program or just the, the teeny house uh, model uh, in, in particular? Well, I, I just think that it's the way to go. And if you're going to keep a sub two, you should consider putting one in the backyard. Mm -hmm. I've got a sub two now that I wanted to put in the backyard in a rural county and they require that the main house, somebody that uh, is an owner occupant. I don't know how they, they track that. Now I'm not sitting here saying, you know, suggesting that you uh, avoid that or ignore that because that's real, but you're gonna see restrictions lifted in these areas. And the thing that I want to tell you too, is if your area doesn't allow, if you're close to a city and it doesn't allow you to build one of these in your backyard, I would stay on it. I would push to get it done because, and I would also stay up to date with them because they're getting pushed from a lot of people on this right. in the background. So I would, just because they don't allow it today, they may allow it tomorrow, but I found that most everybody allows it. There's right. one county that's close to me. It's a big, rich county, mm -hmm. and they their smallest square footage they allow in the county is 900 square feet. But they, I've already talked to the planning uh, people there, and they're working on making some changes. With yeah, that. well, I mean that's the kind of thing that you you have to be at the city council meetings and those yeah. things and talk about affordability and what you're trying to accomplish there. I mean, you get some things changed. Uh, Anthony uh, said, uh, "Sorry if you've already said, but what's the square footage of these teeny homes? You had a range, didn't you, Lisa?" Teeny homes can really be any square footage that you want. Okay, mm -hmm. mine are three twenty six to eight thirty six. And so I have, you know, just studio style, and then I have two bedroom, and I'm getting ready to start one, I mean, we're gonna start two, and I've increased the size 40816, and I'm adding a half bath to the two bedroom one. So now it's gonna be a bath and a half. Okay. All right. Tracy says, fantastic show. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Phil, always tasty goat on Thursday morning. Gee, guy, you're <laughs> killing me. Uh, Dana, sounds like an ADU additional dwelling unit. Accessory uh, dwelling unit. Yes. Yep. Uh, Rudy says, in California, there's a moratorium on ADUs. Uh, local government needs to allow them if everything is properly submitted. I can't imagine California would have a problem with affordable housing. Well, I mean, I, man, you guys in California, why don't y'all move? Exactly. I'm telling you, <laughs> you know, I, I've been telling investors that for years before uh, investing remotely was a thing. Everybody pretty much invested locally. And, and the question would be, I can't do that here. They won't let me do that, whatever. I said, move, you know? I mean, if you want to stay with a job or whatever, then you deal with that sort of thing. But now it's just so easy to buy across the country. I mean, gosh, people virtually drive for dollars now with Google Maps. 
I mean, it's crazy. Right. right. Yeah. And if I can just add one more thing, because mm -hmm. I, my personality is I don't like being told no. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just like, I've right. got to figure out a way around it. Right. If you get told in your area or by your research that you can't do it, there is a workaround and all that is shared in the course. There's yeah. a workaround. There is a work. I, I there love is it. a workaround. I'm super, you know, I'm super interested now. Yes. <laughs> because I, I love the workaround. Yes. And please. it's not illegal. Okay. It's perfectly legal. Well, but nobody again, knows about it. So, and I, and I use this example a lot in, in, in the, the, uh, the firm where, uh, I think I talked about it on the last goat talk where, uh, uh, you know, Gene Hackman is telling Tom Cruise what he wants him to do. And Tom Cruise says, how many laws do you want me to break? And Gene Hackman says, I don't want you to break any, but I want you to bend them till just the point before they break. Uh, listen, you know, sometimes you got to work around things to get them done. Hey, Matt, glad you made it on here with us today. Lisa, thanks so much for being here today and talking to us about REOs and teeny houses. I you know, I, I find myself being very interested in what you're doing now. So I'm gonna have to take a look at what you got going on. But thanks so much for being here and sharing. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Hey, guys, that's it for Goat Talk today. Appreciate you guys being out here. Uh, again, uh, check out Lisa's uh, products, uh, the Teeny House, House USA. And we've got the, uh, the, the URL here in the comments. Go take a look at it. Uh, see if that's something that'll work for you where you are. Sounds like it probably will most places, and there is a big need for affordable housing. Uh, go take a look at sub2palooza.com. We've still got tickets. We may still have some rooms available in the hotel block uh, there at the Hyatt. We're going to have a great time in New Orleans in the French Quarter. Uh, Lisa's going to be there. She, we're going to pin her down to a table for three hours on Thursday night. And she's going to talk all about REOs and teeny houses. So come out and learn all you can. You guys have a great day. Talk to some sellers, buy some houses, and we'll see you next Thursday. So uh, see you then. Thank you.